another player that I saw entering the mining industry is Intel. What's your take on Intel uh, making a large move into producing ASICs? I am super excited about Intel coming. Um, I think it's going to be very good for, so going back to like China kind of dominating the mining industry, the only reliable, like the only large scale ASIC manufacturers in the world are, are Chinese companies. Um, like Bitmain and, and what's my, and MicroBT are the two largest, Bitmain by far the largest, MicroBT, not a very close second. You know, Bitmain probably has like 50% market share, Micro 50, 60, MicroBT, 30, 40. Um, and then you have uh, Kanan and then you kind of have InnoSilicon, but they don't, they're, they're kind of the, 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 the runt of the litter there. Um, and then you have a few others, uh, but, 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 but basically all of them are in China. Um, and you have some in the United States that are trying to do it, like Epic and now Blockstream. But Intel is coming out and they're going to have a product ready this year. I think that's what makes me most excited about it is like we're going to see that machine unless supply chain stuff messes up, messes it up. We're going to see it come out this year. Um, I'm actually writing about it for Ashford and Nexus newsletter. Uh, I'm going to pub it actually after this podcast, probably. Um, so a little inside scoop before we uh, before we post it. But um the uh, the stuff that was reported on earlier this week, like in, uh, Intel presented at a conference called ISSCC. It's like some semiconductor conference. And the specs for it were basically that of miners that were coming out three years ago. And so a bunch of people were on Twitter being like, oh, Intel is like, this is all they got. This is going to be terrible. This is not going to be competitive. But the actual miner is going to be very competitive if, if public filings from one of Intel's customers are to be relieved. Um, it, it looks like it's going to be like 135 terahash and have pretty good uh, energy efficiency too, like lower than some of the newest generation ASICs. And when I say energy efficiency, I mean like how many, how much hash rate a miner is producing per unit of energy. So we measure it in joules per terahash and joules there is, 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 uh, is um, you, you can replace joules with watts there. So like if your machine produces 100 uh, terahashes and it consumes 3000 watts, then your, then your machine produces 30 uh, or consumes 30 watts per terahash. And so Intel's new ASIC is going to be like 21 watts per terahash, which is like lower, which is like lower than, I think it's like comparable with like Bitmain's miner that's coming out later this year, the S9 X10, S19 XP. So um, it'll be super good. I just want to see how many they can produce this first round. I think that's really just the biggest question um like bitcoin miners are on the lowest they're basically like in terms of like semiconductor uh clients they're going to be the last people to get uh, chip allocation right like so like um computer companies um so, uh, cell phone companies car companies uh general appliance companies they're going to be the uh clients that get first priority from like tsmc and some of these other chip manufacturers same thing with Intel, they're going to only allocate a certain amount of chips for this, not their like, you know, computers and things like that. So um, anyway, it'll be interesting to see actually how many they can produce um, and, and how much of it actually spills over into the resale market. Because right now, like grid infrastructure, which is a pretty big, they're, they're going public soon, if they're not already public, they're a big miner. Uh, Block, formerly Square, Jack Dorsey's company is a customer in Argo blockchain. All of these are big companies, they're gonna get the first dibs. And they're not going to sell the machines, right? Like they're buying them, they're going to plug them in, and they're going to run them for as long as they can. So it's going to be probably take a while before these machines hit the resale market, and a lot of North American miners, besides the big guys, can start playing with them. I'm just excited to see something kind of produced um, from a North American company with Bitcoin ASICs, though. The last question is though, it's like, and I don't really totally know the answer to this. It's like, are all the machines, are all the chips Intel's chips, or are they buying five nanometer chips from TSMC? I think they're probably doing the latter if the machines are going to be this competitive. I've actually heard that that Intel has their own foundries. I'm not an expert by any means, but I've heard that that's what separates them from AMD is that AMD has to buy chips from a foundry, whereas Intel has their own foundries. That's that's 100%. And as far as I know, Intel's foundries currently produce like seven nanometer chips. Um, and the lower the nanometer, the more efficient. And I think like the most uh, new, new, new gen ASICs use five nanometer. And I think that they probably, unless they found a way around it, they probably are using five nanometer from another place too. But 
Um, uh, anyway, TLDR, positive thing for the industry. I think for the next two years, you're going to see a lot of ASIC. It's going to be great. You're going to see a lot of new ASIC manufacturers come into play, like Blockstream, um, Intel, stuff like that. Um, some other companies coming to fruition. Uh, and I think that that's just going to really help just drive down prices of ASICs, make them more available and be a little more competitive. Um, but I do also wonder, again, the thing is, like, there are only so many chips that they're going to allocate towards the mining industry. So if Intel starts, you know, actually using their own chips for this, then that's going to be really good because now you have another semiconductor manufacturer actually producing chips for the ASICs themselves. Um, and that just, you know, will actually free up supply, hopefully driving down costs. I mean, I know there's not like a huge amount of um, people making uh, like my, you've got like the ant miner, you've got like, there's only a few different companies, right? And obviously Intel stepping mm -hmm. in. Do you think in the future, um, do you think we'll see like um, an, a massive expansion of the market of like different miners and you'll have miners that will appeal to like different situations? So you'll have like companies that will be best at making miners for hot climates, ones that have better liquid cooling, ones that are better for this and that. Do you think it's going to turn into this kind of like, oh yeah, okay, you're in this country, you probably should go for that miner or oh, you're like a homebrew kind of guy, go for that one or, you know, there's going to be so, like different kind of categories. So to your last point there, I think that like the homebrew thing, I think that's where the distinction would come. I don't think it would necessarily be region specific, but it's like, what are you trying to do for your mining operation, right? Like, I think eventually in the future, you'll have companies and like Bitmain's already kind of used to do this with some racks they would build, but like, you'll have like big miners who are buying like, you know, basically literally like a rack with like five different computers on it. That's like, you know, 2000 tera hash for the whole rack, right? And then you'll have companies um, that are making, you know, less powerful, less maybe more efficient or maybe less efficient depending on how it works out or which chips they use but like less powerful miners for home miners right just for guys who want to just have like something that they can just run make a little passive income um, one thing that i do think that will probably happen eventually and i just don't know who's going to do it but eventually someone's going to put an asic into like a water heater or they're going to like put an asic into like a home furnace because basically you can just recycle the waste heat from these things, especially the more powerful ones, use it to heat your home, use it to heat your water line, all of these things. And you're making money on that. Like, like you're literally like making money to produce heat that you then use in your house. So you can kind of like neutralize your utility bill if you can figure out a way to recycle that properly and in a way that it's efficient. And I think that products like that you know, I don't know if they'll ever be huge. Some Bitcoin miners are going to be like, every home's going to have an, some Bitcoin miners are like, every home's going to have an ASIC in it in 20 years. So that'd be awesome. I don't think that's true. I think uh, people have been saying that for solar panels for like 30 years, right? So it's just like, I think it'll be like something like that, where it'll be like a niche thing. You know, like some people have like rain catchers or like hot water systems that where they're literally heated on the roof of their home. And it's kind of like an efficiency hack thing. And I think some people will make kind of niche kind of boutique products with Bitcoin miners for that, for like heating people's water lines or like their homes and things like that. Um, I would love to see something like that. And I would also love when I have my own house to rig something up like that. Because uh, again, it's just like, that's, that's the thing about Bitcoin mining is like ultimately Bitcoin miners, like you are going to be more competitive if you can find ways to cut costs or if you can find ways to uh, recycle waste or if you can find ways to reduce inefficiencies. And I mean, man, if you can like heat your house with something that makes you money, that's pretty fucking cool. Yeah, why not, right? Like, um, exactly. Like, when we were talking to Connor Alchemist, then, like, one of the things I, I raised was like how people have been quite inventive with like ways to use the heat that's generated by the miners. And there's like this guy who like set up um, something so that it goes from outside and then it like heats like a little like box home for like uh these like kittens that have been like, like these stray kittens and stuff and he's like it's like this just kind of stuff like that's a really cool initiative i like seeing stuff like that like people inventing things around like um the excess heat created by miners um especially for cold climates it can be really useful 100 mm -hmm. if if utilities uh utility companies do come in like to mining and, and they start setting up their own infrastructure do you think then we could possibly see an asic in every house but like they're just harvesting the, the I feel I, I don't know. I don't I don't think so because I feel like it would require like the like appliances manufacturers to do it. So it's like imagine if like GE just came out with like 
you know, like a special purpose, like furnace or something that like had an AC in it. Like that's what it would probably look like. But I mean, I do think to your point, like utilities getting involved might make it, everything advances the conversation and kind of like, uh, you know, um, moves the ball forward a little bit, right? Like, you know, two years, three, four years ago, um, politicians talking about Bitcoin or like utilities providers or energy providers mining Bitcoin probably would have sounded insane to the most, to the general population. But I think, you know, that stuff's starting to happen and you're starting to see general acceptance or just like, you know, people may think that like Bitcoin is like not, like they're not going to buy it. They may think it's overvalued and stuff, but they're starting to like say like, well, it's not really going away. Kind of like in the same way that like some people will be like, oh, well, I'm not going to buy Tesla stock because it's overvalued, but they don't think that Tesla is necessarily like a scam company. They think they're overvalued, but they don't necessarily think that like this is a Ponzi scheme, right? I think we're kind of at that point with Bitcoin. So, you know, maybe it's not totally absurd that utilities or, uh, you know, appliances manufacturers start doing stuff like that. But um, I, I, uh, I think that, I don't know. It's going to require a lot of orange pilling before we get there. Uh, waiting for the TV, that the smart TV that mines. Yeah, oh, right. Everything, everything mining. That's the true uh, web. You know, was it uh, not web three point What's the thing where it's like uh, we're going to have all the uh, all the things like our microwave and everything connected to the internet? I can't remember what that's called now. Internet of Things. Internet of Things. That's it. The true yeah, Internet of Things. Right. Everything. Everything's a miner. <laughs> it's like yeah. Uh, your washing machine is also mining at the same time as washing the clothes. Your your uh, Xbox and PS5 is a miner when you're not yeah. playing. It's just <laughs> hashing away in the background. That's the dream. That, that's something that actually kind of does make sense. Like if you could like program like the GPUs on your like consoles to like mine shit coins and then just convert it to Bitcoin. Anyway. Oh, there we this, go. This is what happens when you start mining, dude. You just like things like how can I harness all of the computing power in the world to make hash rate? <laughs> Um, back to Intel. Intel is also coming out with GPUs. So, do you see that as them trying to get into the shitcoin mining market? Oh or man, I that wonder. they're actually just trying to alleviate the su- the supply shortage of GPUs for gamers. Mm, I think it's probably that. I think it's more that. I think they see an opportunity there. Like prices are just inflated. GPU mining is weird because you have like no one in the altcoin industry wants proof of work. Like no one in Ethereum wants proof of work. Very few altcoiners want proof of work. They see proof of work as dirty. They see proof of stake as like new and futuristic and like a good thing. And like proof of work is like boomer coin shit. Um, and so Nvidia's um, Nvidia has a purpose built. Like they 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 build a GPU just for Ethereum mining. And like HUD eight bought but a, bought a bunch of them. I think Hive might have two two big mining companies. But I don't think many people are buying them, um, according to what I've heard, um, or from what I've seen. I feel like I've heard the like sales for those have plunged, and I think that generally it's kind of weird, right? Because at Luxor, like we launched an ETH pool because ETH is like crazy uh, lucrative to mine. It's extremely lucrative to mine, even after EIP one five five nine or whatever that was, where they like took away mining fees. Which like that EI, sorry to like go on a tangent here. Like that EIP right there shows you how much, uh, in, in my opinion, how much the ETH community hates mining. It's like, you hate this thing so much that like the entire Ethereum 2.0, like I don't know if you guys know what the difficulty bomb is, but like the difficulty bomb is basically, yeah, Lawrence is nodding his head. It's a, it's, it's a thing that is going to mark Ethereum's transition to proof of stake. Once it goes off, Ethereum's difficulty will continue to uh, increase until it becomes impossible to win a block. And so like all of Ethereum's moves towards proof of stake are done with the mind to kneecap the mining uh, industry or the mining sector, make sure that they do not want to do it, which is totally screwed, but they're still doing it, which is so funny, right? Because it's just, it's just so much money in it. And so Luxor, we launched an ETH pool recently and everyone was like why are you doing that proof of stake is coming around the corner and we were like we don't think it's going to come for a while and like a few weeks later the ethereum community like the ethereum foundation put out that thing where it's like we're not calling it ETH 2.0 anymore it's like we're calling it like the execution layer and the activation layer some like complete just like gobbledygook but um 
Yeah, um, I, I think the most, uh, I think the Intel probably will just stick to Bitcoin mining for now because the future for uh, proof of work on Ethereum and other altcoins is just so sketchy. Yeah, I, I was, I remember reading up on the ETH 2.0, like, so I remember, I don't know, maybe two years ago, spending a lot of time, like, trying to understand, uh, like, the different, like, obviously, it was uh, Casper, the, like, ghost options or whatever, <laughs> I can't, right. went to that, and, and I spent a lot of time, like, reading up on it, and I even wrote, like, a blog post on it at the time, like, because I was just interested to try and understand what the two proposals were, or the two right. main proposals were, and then where they went, they went for like a hybrid of the two, and then they were, this was their plan for 2.0. And then, so I understood it to quite a good degree. So then I then realized that what they had been doing and what they were doing wasn't really seemingly making much of a difference. So it seemed like as the, the time frame was going to be dragged out a lot. And then obviously, Vitalik essentially kind of admitted that, didn't he? And that basically, oh yeah, we're trying, but it's kind of taking a lot longer than we thought it would. And actually, it's not yep. going to make that much difference to the speed. And so I think you're right. Like it seems like it's going to take a, a number of years until we get anywhere near this like ETH 2.0. If we do, I, 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 yeah, I don't even know if it's ever going to happen. I mean, I, yeah. I don't think it. I don't think it's coming. I don't think yeah. it's coming. Like over the past three four years, like Ethereum community has had over like at least five different names for different you know skinning solutions they've been you know raiding network sharding you know sharding is coming um you know now they just you know they basically just um pitched their forks with um the tenth with um um um, L2s, you know, Polygon and the side chains basically. So all this talk about sharding, uh, uh, the, um, Radiant Network, I think Radiant Network has a token now where it's you know, totally gone to shit. And we just keep hearing these, you know, futuristic terms, you know, to keep, keep sucking in people into, you know, gambling, DeFi and stuff like that, you know, just to keep the whole, you know, Ethereum ecosystem interesting enough for people to actually come in, you know, get to the ETH names and become, you know, as cringe as forgive me, but um, uh, what, what's the dude's name? The, uh, is it Adam from Bankless to the Future? Forgive me, but that dude is so very cringe to actually, you know, read his tweets. And, you know, he just kept dot keep names and stuff, you know, babbling the state, the common so, you know, annoying on Twitter. So I think, yeah, I think it doesn't make any sense for companies to actually start, you know, uh, developing plans, futuristic plans around something that is not very reliable. Bitcoin is, is actually reliable. And that is one of the, you know, that is one of the, the pros of actually, you know, building on Bitcoin or, you know, having to deal with Bitcoin. Yeah, I would agree with that. I feel like Bitcoin just has legitimacy that the other coins don't. Like Ethereum is the closest one. But like even that, like Ethereum, uh, very few miners are mining Ethereum on the scale that they're mining Bitcoin. Like Hive and... Um, Hive and HUD8 are some of the largest ones that are doing it on an industrial scale, but most of them, like you said, like to your point, Jerry, most of them aren't doing it because it's just, there's too much uncertainty. It's like you're not going to invest like hundreds of millions, tens of millions of dollars into these machines, right? You, a long time ago, when I interviewed you for Living on Crypto in the USA, you said that you felt that custodial lightning wallets were going to play a larger role. And now we see in El Salvador with the legal tender law, Chivo being a custodial wallet, Bitcoin Beach being a custodial wallet. Um, I just wanted to get your input on it. Oh man, yeah, Chivo has been such a such a hassle, right? Such a shit show. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of been an, I'm interesting to see that thesis play out. I totally forgot that I had made that prediction. Um, but I mean, Strike's another good example, right? I mean, Strike is completely custodial, and it's kind of like you know they try to market it as something different, and it is. It's unlike any other wallet or tool we've had. Um, but yeah, I think it's, a uh, the Chiba thing is particularly unfortunate because it was like El Salvador's like chance to like, really be like, Hey, like we're making you dot Bitcoin, but don't worry. It's going to be cool, bro. And they just completely fumbled it. They screwed the pooch. Um, so I hope that that incentivizes the good thing about it is that I hope that it incentivizes education and people to like actually use the good, to, like the good third-party wallets, you know, that exist. Which is really confusing me. I don't know why El Salvador didn't just do that in the first place. Like there are dozens of good developers out there that it could made them an amazing wallet, but they didn't do that. So hopefully people will start using those. Fingers crossed. Um, all right. Well, yeah, that dude. Thanks for for joining us. It's been uh, much appreciated. I uh, always a pleasure chatting with you. Um, is there any sort of final uh, words or any plugs you wanna wanna do before you head out? Uh, yeah, I guess I'll plug Hashrate Index. Um, follow Hashrate Index on Twitter. Follow Luxor 
uh, on Twitter, not the casino, Luxor Mining. Um, Luxor Tech Team is our, te our handle. And uh, you can find me at As I Lay Hodling on Twitter. And yeah, the, uh, Lawrence, uh, Ricardo, Jerry, thanks so much for having me on. Always enjoyed chatting with you guys. Oh, and uh, check out BitRefill. BitRefill is awesome. I use it on the weekly. Uh, sometimes I treat myself to some DoorDash. It's amazing. Thank you, guys. Much appreciate it, man. It's been good. Um, so yeah, thanks. Thanks for joining us again. Uh, thanks for Carl and Jerry for joining me. And uh, thank you for all of the listeners out there for listening and having a great time. Uh, as always, uh, have an amazing day, week, month, year. Uh, have a lovely time and keep buying Bitcoin and keep being happy. Take care. Thank you.